did he offer for her? Oh, <laughs> to Bruce? <laughs> <or Walter? laughs> Anticipation of the triumphal entry and the switch from Hosanna to crucify him because he didn't meet their expectations. He wasn't who they expected him to be. And the same thing was with John. He thought it was supposed to go this way and that way, and Jesus doesn't do that. So, you know, are you the coming one or aren't you? Or, you know. Are you going to finish that statement? Yeah, no, I'm just, that's like, he's just, he's confused as well. He's a sinner yeah, like the rest of us. I expect you to say, and the same thing is for us. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Boy, when he doesn't meet our expectations, yeah, what's the use of believing in him? Is he really the Messiah? Yeah. When this whole thing of Aging. I know there are a few of you here. You can't even relate to aging. <laughs> but a few of us can relate to aging. Comes fast. Yeah. Because you know joints go, heart valves go. Yeah. Brain. You know organs go. We get invaded by various things. Oh yes, we have canes because joints are going. Yes, right. And we get invaded by cancers and pneumonias and what's that other thing that's so popular? 
<laughs> oh, yeah. Right. We're not going to name it because we're trying to ignore the whole pandemic. <laughs> yes. But there's John. There's John's genuine question. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we implore you to hear our prayers and to lighten the darkness of our hearts by your gracious visitation. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 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 Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For God is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, the Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. Okay, Sunday school. And whomever else. Sunday school needs to be rounding up all of their day school classes and classmates to be here. Yes. Okay, we're going to try to do Mark 13. We're going to try to do Mark 13 so that next week we can do Mark 14. Because then, when Pastor Crow does three weeks in January, we have a nice logical break before yeah, we deal with the last two chapters of Mark. So, Mark 13. And Jesus came out of the temple. One of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations, and when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver you over to death, and father his child, 
and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. <coughs> so Jesus used the opportunity afforded by the disciples' question to instruct them about the turbulent times to come, times when he would no longer be physically with them. In a method similar to that used by Old Testament prophets, Jesus referred to things that were to happen shortly and events that will happen at the end time, all blended into one panoramic picture. These verses supply a good illustration of prophetic foreshadowing of history. This foretelling of prophecy is done in two-dimensional man manner that the perspective of time is usually either lacking or vague. This may well be because time has no independent as existence outside of temporal order. This prophetic foreshadowing often passes over in silence the sequence of several events, the vast stretches of time that separate them, and so joins closely events which are actually far apart. Here, God's immediate judgment of his people at one particular point in history is almost imperceptibly dovetailed into his universal judgment on all humanity at the last day, since both are manifestations of God's continual ongoing judgment on human sin and rebellion. The whole makes sense. So Jesus' primary purpose in this discourse appears to have been to call out four, 13, five to six. Are wars, earthquakes, and famines sign that the end of the world is imminent? <laughs> Are there signs that the end of the world is coming? Yes. 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 Uh, in an old series of sermons prepared for pastors called Concordia Pulpit, oh, I think somewhere in the 50s, there was a sermon on, I think Luke and not on Mark, but it just portrayed the events of World War II and the Korean War and the atomic bomb as signs that before the 50s were over, the end of the world would come. One of the most dangerous Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod sermons I ever read. <laughs> It scared the living daylights out of me when Pastor <coughs> Andrew used part of it in a sermon at Faith Anderson. He did it here too. He did here too? <laughs> it must have been while I was in back of <laughs> I don't remember him doing it here while I was in the hearing. But yes, and I'm thinking, no, you're in the wrong canoe. <laughs> yeah. Swimming upstream. <laughs> yeah. Get over to a few other churches that love to convert people by scaring the hell out of them. Yeah? That's not how you bring people to be children of heaven. But, yeah, oh yeah, the Lake Lake Camp, Planet Earth, and similar movies that were done like that is trying to say, before we get home from Holy Cross today, Jesus is reappearing. Now, all of those are signs. Did you see the real sign of the end in Jesus speaking? It comes in Matthew, 
It comes in Mark. It shows up in Luke. What's the real sign of the internet? The internet. <laughs> hey, you were in early service. <laughs> yeah, all of these technological things are great things for which we give things. They just don't help us understand why and their purpose and their value, right? For all of us that are condemning science and technology and all these other things, I basically say, no, we don't condemn them. We just realize they all have limits. Science can prove things from what you see. But all of us are in a box of cause and effect in time and space. And when science tries to get out of the box and tells <coughs> us what happens outside that box, science is misused. It has a limit. Okay, Howard. Well, the biggest sign is when Mary, a virgin, conceived, because that was the dividing line. Everything after that is the end times. Yes. And what is the um, what is the actual sign? Jonah. Savior. It's here. Per persecutions. It's verse ten. The gospel must be proclaimed. Yes. The gospel the must be plain to all ethnic groups. <laughs> yeah, you have to read nations as ethnic groups and not as political entities in the world. And when will that be? It's going to be a while. When was it? Pardon? When was it? When was it? When is it? When is it actually proclaimed? Yeah. You know, this is the time of year for fundraisers. And if your box isn't filled with Lutheran Bible translators asking for funding, <laughs> they're always telling you they need funding because there are still ethnic groups out there that don't have the Word of God, that have not heard. The gospel has not yet been preached to them. Well, God may say 90% is fine. God may say, I'm not going to be happy till it's 100%. God may say it's 75% is fine. But when verse 10 of Mark 13 is done to God the Father's, satisfaction, that's when the end will come. Until then, we have to keep watching and we keep waiting. Jesus was clear that his followers would be persecuted because they followed him. But in spite of persecution, what must, according to God's divine plan, happen before the end of the world? We just talked about that. What is the disciple's source of boldness and defense when they are brought before civil authorities for the sake of Jesus? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. It's John's Gospel account that talks about the Holy Spirit coming and, the Holy, and tells us really what the Holy Spirit's work is. What's the Holy Spirit's work? Proclamation. And for each one of us to be able to speak the truth. Remember what Jesus taught us. Boy, how many of us have been on the spot when people ask a question mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we're thinking, oh no, I've got yeah, early Christian Alzheimer's. <laughs> I can't remember a word that Jesus said to me. 
And then all of a sudden, something comes to us. And we don't even know if it makes sense. The Holy Spirit bringing to your memory what needs to be said at that point. Mm -hmm. and that's the comfort that is right here. When you're put on the spot, maybe you're not on trial before the civil authorities, but you're on trial by your fellow employees, employer, next door neighbor, friend who's over for dinner. Yes, Barbara? When I find, and it's probably not often enough, when I find I cannot speak, answer the question, or say anything, in the end I go, oh, thank you, God, I probably would have really said some dumb stuff. <laughs> or maybe I shouldn't have said anything, and he's going, zip. <laughs> you know, most of us have been around Lutheran Church, Missouri Center, enough to realize that we've been tortured um, into memorizing things like the catechism. <laughs> right? Yeah. And most of us have come up with all of the arguments about why you don't have to memorize this stuff. <laughs> Guess what? There's a reason. God just told you, if you haven't memorized this stuff, the Holy Spirit has very little up here to work with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, go home, take out your catechism, Refresh your memory. Yes, memory work is required. Over and over and over. Over and over again. We Just call because it. you were confirmed doesn't mean I graduated, I can forget where that book is. Pastor, we call it Learn My Heart Now. Okay. <laughs> Learn My Heart. Learn My Heart. No. Because my heart is a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> I need to learn it by heart, so it fills up that dark place with the right place. <laughs> so, what is in store for those who stand firm in the faith, in the face of hatred, even from family members, until the end? Pardon? We call them martyrs. Jesus Those calls who endure to the end will be saved. Yes. He who endures to the end will be saved. Will be saved. Blessed are you when you're persecuted. Pardon? Blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. It's a blessing. Yes. <clears throat> okay, anything else? Yeah. Okay. Can I throw out something for consideration, Pastor? We, we, you mentioned earlier the time uh, diff difficulty, and especially with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, et cetera, et cetera. His time is not like our time. And so when we talk about the end, are we talking about the end end, in meaning the end day, the last moment, or are we talking about the end times, meaning and then the end will come, which we refer to the end times and all of this fulfillment as from... Jesus' uh, 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 resurrection and ascension and then forward, and especially there is some thought that this passage has already been fulfilled, that the gospel must be preached to all nations. And that's just a sign of the end times which we are living in now. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And Peter stands up and proclaims the gospel to all nations. Yes. Done. And yet. And so, and it's still, yeah. It's an ever going, ongoing process from then on. You know, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, all and every. Doesn't always refer to absolutely every single. Why? Bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. but, but in the known world, the known world they're all there. They have yeah. representatives from all the known world. And as soon as 
the gospel hits Europe, they discover, oh, there's this <coughs> weird group up there. You know, the Britons and the Scots and the Irish. <coughs> and so finally, somebody wanders up there to preach to them. Not too long, because he's martyred, but nevertheless, they discover the world is bigger. They haven't found Scandinavia yet. <laughs> yeah. That's way up there. <laughs> yeah. And there's this weird place. Oh, where is that? Oh, North and South America. <laughs> and Africa only goes as far south as Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, although many and all can be that, just like all of Jerusalem and Judea <coughs> are out to hear John preach. <coughs> oh, you can't figure every single one did. Okay, Barbara? I would say the end of the world was coming ever since Adam and Eve sin, and uh, these wars, earthquakes, famines have been the whole time, and we've, we've been living on borrowed time. Well, Howard kind of did this the way that we view time. Mm -hmm. The former time was all the way up to the conception mm -hmm. of Jesus in Mary's womb. End time began with that <coughs> and goes to the end. You read the Old Testament prophets, oh, particularly Daniel, Zephaniah, um, Joel, when you need any of the prophets, they're talking about, they're giving you a, a prophecy. They're preaching as much as they're telling the future. You know, and people argued about Isaiah 714. Was he really talking about a virgin birth or was he talking about a birth then? The answer is yes. <laughs> Some of this was going to happen then, but some of it wasn't going to happen until the Holy Spirit conceived uh, Jesus in the womb of Mary. And then there's this whole recognition. Where is the presence of God when the temple doesn't have an Ark of the Covenant? They're only creating a fabrication about God being presence in the Holy of Holies in Herod's temple. Where is the presence of God? It's in Mary's womb. His specific local presence. Where is he? In the manger. Where is he? Uh, up in Nazareth, growing. Where is he? Wherever Jesus is, that's where the presence of God is. And then you deal with that whole issue of time. I wish Pastor Fro were here at this moment um, because he expresses it so well. Time is always present where God is. We talk about past, future, and now. With God, it is always now. God makes a promise. And we have it now, but we say, not yet. In God's timing, it's all right here. It's not now and not yet. But we are just these physical people, anchored on the 12th of December. Yeah? 2021 and we're counting the days until December 25th until January 1 because we're such linear people mm -hmm. but with God the end time it began with the conception it is the end last day and now at the same time so what's Jesus doing in uh, Mark 13. He's saying all of this is going to happen. 
and yet it's going to be 35 plus years before the temple's destroyed. And since the temple's been destroyed, for us, it's centuries, and we're still looking for that last day. Um, so, let's see, I'm going forward. Okay, we ready to move on? Okay, 14 to 23. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where you ought not to be, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those, let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days. <coughs> Pray that it may not happen in winter, for in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created <coughs> until now, and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect, but be on guard. I have told you all things beforehand. Here Jesus was clearly talking about the destruction of Jerusalem and answering the specific question asked by the disciples. Mark 13, 14 contains a quotation from Daniel about the coming desolation that was to be the signal for Christ's followers to flee immediately. Understand this signal to the army surrounding Jerusalem. The church in Jerusalem heeded Jesus' warning, fleeing across the Jordan River to the city of Pella shortly before the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. In 1319, Jesus described the enormity of the destruction in words similar to those used by the historian Josephus, who witnessed the destruction of the city. Shortly after destroying the city, Rome became preoccupied with affairs back home and hastily withdrew many troops, thus cutting short the destruction, something God caused to happen for the sake of the elect. During those days, Many false messiahs arose, but Jesus had forewarned his disciples not to be deceived by them. <clears throat> okay, marching forward. Mark, 20, Mark 13, 24. But in those days, after the tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken, and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds and from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. With only a vague reference uh, to the time intervening in those days following that distress, Jesus then began to teach about his return or reappearing. What will happen to the elect when the Son of Man comes?
comes in the clouds with great power and glory. They'll be gathered up by the angels. Now, what assurance did Jesus give his disciples? From the fig tree learn this lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. What assurance does he give? His word. The word. The word. The word. His word. It is unclear whether uh, 28 through 30 refers to the destruction of Jerusalem or the end of the world. Because he's talking about um, all, um, all these things will take place. And you look at commentators, and some look at the tense of the verb and say, okay, we're in the end times. You know, the fact that these things are set in motion have already taken place. Others will say, this is God's sense of time. Yeah, they're taking place. Um, we know that the end day is certain. And because Jesus said it, and his word will not pass away, even though we don't know when that time will come. Mary. Well, talking about the timeline, I would imagine that the destruction of Jerusalem was the end of the world for a lot of people. And, you know, I think that as humans, we witness a lot of end of the worlds in our lifetime. In, end of our world, or the end of our, where we put all of our hope. Right. Yeah. <coughs> it's not the end of the world that Jesus is talking about, but yes, end of our hope. You think of the Jewish people. <clears throat> From the time of the tabernacle, all of their faith hope, all of their belief in God's promises, were anchored in the fact that God came to be with them, to be present, so they knew where to find him. And the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy of Holies. When God's people broke the covenant and went into exile, you have to see this image of God packing up his suitcase and flying off to Babylon. <coughs> He's no longer present in the temple. So when the Ark of the Covenant is destroyed, they haven't destroyed God. He already packed up a suitcase and left. While the people are in Babylon, they're saying, where can we find God? They say, well, he must be in his word. We hear his voice. The voice of Genesis 1, the voice of the prophets, and they begin to diligently seek God in his word. They get back to Jerusalem and they build a temple, and they build this temple, and the people weep at the dedication. Is it because it's an ugly building? No. No. <laughs> It's because the Holy of Holies 
is empty. All of their hope was once they build the temple, that in some way the ark would be present and they know that God would be there. Why is that so important to have a local presence here on earth? Because only there did they know their sins were fully forgiven. The whole sacrificial system, the whole day of atonement, all depended upon God being present and receiving your repentance, receiving your offering, and forgiving your sins. Without God being present, are you forgiven? We hope so, but no certainty. Herod's temple is great, and they say, we don't need the Ark of the Covenant, because what we have is the stone that Jacob slept on in the Holy of Holies. And remember in Joseph's, in, not Joseph, Jacob's dream, what did he see? Angels going up and down the ladder to heaven and to mm -hmm. earth. So if you got the stone that he slept on, this must be where <coughs> God is present here for us. And all the Jewish people are putting their hopes again. God being present in the Holy of Holies. The temple is destroyed. And the question is, where is God? Where is God? That's a question for us too. Oh yes, God is present everywhere. But when's the last time a squirrel came up to you and said, Mary, I forgive your sins. <laughs> When's the last time you heard from a tree? Boy, I hope Don't I answer that. See that. <laughs> When's the last question. time that a tree <clears throat> announced the word of God to you? When the wind blew at my house and the birds were chirping and I was watching the tree and listening and God was there. But he doesn't He is there sense. by his <laughs> what? Power. Power. Where is he in his mercy and forgiveness? Where he promised to be? Where is that? Where is our sacrifice? Right. That whole thing, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, when we're gathered from the service, he is there. We are gathered. As soon as we get that invocation, we are gathered there in his name. And what does he do? He calls us to confess. And what does he do once we confess our sins? I forgive you. God says that. It's God's voice. We don't need the Ark of the Covenant. We don't need the Holy of Holies that was in the Old Covenant. We have the Holy of Holies right here when we gather in his name. Okay, there was a hand somewhere. Barbara. <coughs> Excuse <tonight>. me. <laughs> um, what comes to my mind if I doubt that there is, um, God is present, and uh, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I shall be, there he is, there's God. Yeah, you know, we, we get this over and over again. What's the message at Christmas? Christ is born, and he is called whom? What's his name? Emmanuel. 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 Which means God with, us. God with us. And when Jesus, at his ascension, departs from the disciples, what does he say to the disciples? and to the church. Emmanuel. Lo, I am with you always, always to the end of the age. That's Emmanuel. <clears throat> Mary. I saw um, about a week ago um, that somebody on the TV said that Christmas is no longer for Christians. 
I went, boy, you have just, just blown by the reason for the season. <clears throat> oh, no, Barbara has mm -hmm. the new reason for the season. It came out in the Christmas carols that she was listening to. It has nothing to do with Christ. Mm. What was the phrase, Barb? Um, oh. Something about, uh, about loving one another. Yeah, that's, that's the reason for Christmas. That's the reason for the season. That's what the, the carol said. Yeah, same thing. Christmas is no longer for Christians. What do you mean? It's the birth of Christ. Christmas is for children. Christmas is for children. <laughs> you bet. This child. Yes, this child. That's a good comeback. Well, pardon? I like that. Thank you. Yeah. This the Holy Spirit must have been somebody said. This child. <laughs> on their fireplace. Yeah, this child. This child. Christ was born for me. That's Christmas. When Christ was talking about false prophets, what Barbara heard was part of false prophecy. Mm -hmm. yes. Telling us we don't have to think about God. We have to think about loving each other. Oh yeah. You know, you, we hear all of it at this time of the year. Well, that's too whether good. it's <laughs> Christmas <laughs> specials, <laughs> whether it's the rest. Okay, Andy, and then we have to close. In my neighborhood, evidently, at least to some people, Christmas basically has to do with inflatable dinosaurs. Dressed like Santa Claus. Very good. Christmas is inflatable dinosaurs. concert tonight at <laughs> yeah. 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 six o'clock the Episcopal Church yeah, on Wildcat.